Sunday morning. We're looking forward to a great day. Yesterday was cool. It felt a little bit like fall. And today, I think we're getting near 80. So if you like the warm weather, congratulations. It's here today. But uh, God is good. 490. Let's sing Revive Us Again. We praise the old God for the sun. church this morning. I hope you had a great week and probably busy because if you live in South Jersey, it's always busy, but you survived and thrived, right? I thank the Lord for that. We had Bible college graduation on Thursday. Thanks for everyone who came to that. It was a great blessing. Man, it was just exciting and the kids did a great job. Yesterday, we had our Master Clubs Regionals. That's our young people, part of the Master Clubs program. And some of you were involved with helping with that, or you had your children participating in it. So that's wonderful. And I'm glad that uh, our church family gets behind these type things. So lots going on. Pastor Clark's preaching in West Virginia this morning. And so we're going to be praying for him. He's there with my mom. I want to thank anybody who prayed for me. I was preaching Friday and Saturday in Missouri. Got back last night. And so it's good to be back in the promised land of New Jersey. Hallelujah. And no place like this place, so this must be the place. And I'm glad for it. And uh, we're going to pray and ask God to help us today because we need the Lord's help. And everybody here, we all have our own burdens and things we're praying about and some things heavy on the heart. So we'll pray about these and that God would bless and help and give the grace that we need for today. All right, so as I pray here from the pulpit, please pray along with me in your heart. Father, I do pray that you would help us today. Lord, you're our helper, and we love that, that we can come to you with our burdens and, Lord, things that are weighing on us, and that you hear us and that you do help us. And so I pray for grace to be felt, Lord, just in this time of need. Help each person here with the different things that are Lord, on their minds, on their hearts, and help us, please. I pray for those dealing with physical ailment. I pray for people praying for healing. Lord, I pray you give them the healing that they're praying for. And God, I pray for Pastor Clark as he's preaching in West Virginia today. I pray you'd fill him with the Holy Ghost. I pray you give them a great service there and give him safety as he travels back this afternoon. Lord, I pray for Christians around the world as they gather in Bible-preaching churches, that you protect them. And Lord, I pray that you would help people that are in places where there's persecution for being a Christian. And Lord, watch over them, protect them, please. Lord, I pray for our nation. We need revival. Oh God, may it begin right here and in this place. We pray you'd revive us and repair us, refresh us, renew us, restore us. Well, we need your help. Pray for the junior churches going on right now. You bless all three of those. 
Pray be a Spanish church. Help Brother Carlos. Be a deaf church, please, Lord. Help Brother Chris. And God, I pray bless afternoon church and evening church. And God, we need your presence. We don't want to just check box church. Lord, we don't want to just go through the motions. So Father, I pray in the powerful name of the Lord Jesus Christ that your spirit would be felt in our hearts and that all of us would be responsive. Help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. I pray you put a hedge of protection about us. We thank you so much for the lovely Lord Jesus. And we pray in his precious and holy and wonderful name and all God's people said, amen. And you may be seated. Let's listen as the choir sings. Amen. May the Lord help us each and every day to share the gospel with this lost world. Jesus is the answer. Let's stand together. Three, five, five. Wonderful grace of Jesus. I'm so thankful for the grace of God in our lives. Three, five, five. Wonderful grace. Wonderful grace of Jesus.
Good singing, and you can be seated. Appreciate everybody in choir singing today. Appreciate orchestra. Appreciate everybody in the congregation. If you're our guest here today, please make yourself at home, and we really do mean that and want you to enjoy the service, want God to give you whatever it is that you do need. And if you're here as a first-time guest or here just once in a while, we like to give you a response card. If you don't mind filling it out, as you leave, there'll be ushers standing at the back. You just pass it off to one of the ushers. We're not going to make you stand up and give a speech or anything, but if you're here today for the first time or here just once in a while, and if you don't mind, would you raise your hand just high enough where the men would find you very, very quickly? These guys are super fast, and they'll get to your row, and if you could take one of those and fill it out, and then again, as you leave at the back, the ushers will be there, and you just pass it off to them. So thank you for being there, and uh, awesome, wonderful, wonderful. Not sure how you heard about us, but uh, we hope the service will be a blessing to you today. We're going to pray for our offering at this time. If you like to give, you can give online. If you're new to the church and would like to register for online giving, you could do that at solidrockinfo.org, or you can give it to an usher as you leave. There'll be ushers there with offering plates at the back, or you can mail it into the church or bring it by the church during the week, whatever you like to do. We're going to pray and ask God to bless our offering time. Giving is part of our worship. And that's what the Bible clearly teaches. So let's pray about that. Father, I do pray that you'd be pleased with this offering. Lord, I pray you would help your people as we want to be faithful in giving our tithes and our offerings, our faith promise missions giving. Lord, I pray that you bless every single person who gives. And I pray you take care of them and meet their needs. I pray you take care of this church. And Lord, we're relying on you for the day to day. God, I pray you give us miracle money so we could build the buildings that should be built. And Lord, I just pray you'd step in for us and do great things and mighty things that would definitely give you all the glory. And we love you and praise you. Thank you for the abundance that you've put into our lives in so many different areas. And we thank you most of all for the Lord Jesus. We pray in his precious and holy and wonderful name. Amen. Listen to the words of this song. Let it speak to your heart. Was 
my life story. Unworthy was my name, had no future, just a long and broken past. But I'm standing here today to say, Jesus changed all that. Amen. Christ makes all the difference, doesn't he? Thank God. We may not be what we ought to be, but we're not what we used to be because Jesus comes, and if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, and uh, life is always better after Jesus. Thank God for that. Let's stand together. We're going to sing a chorus, You Are My All in All. Sing together this morning. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus. Yo 
Give somebody near you one reason why you love Jesus. Come on, share something. One reason why you love Jesus. Come on. One reason why you love him. He's awesome. He's amazing. Thank God for Jesus. seated. There's no name like the name of Jesus. Thank God for what he did for you and I on the cross. The angry crowd cried out to crucify. They nailed him to a rugged cross and left him there to die. They gambled for the royal robe he wore, not knowing they had crucified my Lord. He bore the sin and shame of all mankind. And as he hung there That's my God, and I love Him. That's my Jesus, He died for me. For all the world to Him, I'll say it loud and clear. That's my God, that's my God. Nothing more than a fairy tale. He's just a myth or legend, and his presence is not real. His word is not correct politically. They curse and mock his name defiantly. changeless one and their lives cannot disprove the existence of God's son though some may be content to just sit
you, family. Appreciate that song. Please turn to the Word of God to the book of 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1 in your Bible. And if you don't have a Bible, there's one there in the songbook rack. And I think you'd be on page 1049. 1049, if you need one of the Bibles there from the songbook rack, please feel free to use that. We were in 1 Peter chapter 1 last Sunday evening. I want to encourage you to come back for Sunday night church. And we have, it's a different message from the Word of God, different songs, all of the Sunday night services. And so you can learn a lot from the Bible. It's our family service. All the kids and teens are in here. It's a great time. So we were in 1 Peter chapter 1 last Sunday night where in verse 7 we talked about and preached about the trial of your faith. And we mentioned, I'll just give a quick review, that the trial of your faith is the testing of your Christianity. And so it's part time. Verse 6 says it's for a season. And it's for a purpose. It says here in verse 6, if need be, if God decides that it's his choice to allow the testing of your Christianity, then that's important. We made mention that it comes through many problems. In verse 6 it says manifold temptations, all different types of trials, testings, tribulation. It could be spiritual, it could be physical, mental, emotional, social, financial. We talked about the trial of your faith is painful. In verse 6 you are in heaviness. In times you have that, there's no doubt about it. But it's precious. Verse 7 says it's more precious than of gold that perisheth. So God uses it and God blesses it. Went along with our adult Bible class lesson today from the book of Romans and talking about having eternal perspective. So we go through some suffering now, but it doesn't last forever. From James 1, we learned it produces patience. Also in James 1, we learned that it makes you perfect in the sense of complete and spiritually mature. It brings praise in chapter 1, verse 7 of 1 Peter here, might be found unto praise and glory and honor. I believe partly that praise is what God does for us and commending us, but it's ultimately for Jesus to get all the glory for our story. We talked about how it cultivates your passion in verse 6, the idea of that you would uh, love and, and rejo rejoice and, and we would love, and this is important. And then lastly, and in verse 9, we talked about that the trying, the, the trying of our faith, the trial of our faith is part of our permanent reward. In verse 9, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, even the salvation of your souls. So there's the salvation of our souls in the sense of when we get saved and in this present moment when we put our faith in Christ. There's ultimately, though, the salvation when Jesus comes again and we leave this world and go on to the next world. And I want you to hear me today. If you're here and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your own personal Lord and Savior, you can know him. The Bible says you can know Jesus personally. Kate was up here singing about her life and how Jesus impacted her life and touched her life. And it made her cry. You say, why? Because she's not just singing words, she's singing from the heart. And the Lord changed her life. I remember when she came in as a new Christian. I remember the first service she was there in the old Atco building. And God brought her in and God had changed her life. She had a dear lady that had led her to Christ and cha Jesus changed her life. And that's not just for a few select people. The Lord can change your life today. Now you have to understand what's called the gospel and there's four basic elements of that. I'll just say very quickly. Number one, we're all sinners. You have to be willing to admit that you're a sinner. Sin is anything you do that's wrong. We're born with a sin nature and we're also sinners by choice. Because of sin, there's a price that has to be paid. There's a punishment given for sin. That punishment, according to the Bible, is there's a real place called hell. And people who die without Christ, people who die with their sin still on their account, will pay for that in hell for all of eternity. And hell is a horrible place and you don't want to go to hell and you don't have to go to hell. Because for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's Jesus. God gave Jesus to die for you. That whosoever, anybody, believeth in him 
Believeth is not just to have a head knowledge, but it's to have a heart belief. Believeth in him should not perish, which means you don't have to go to hell, but have everlasting life, which is a home in heaven when you die. Maybe you've been coming to the church here recently, or maybe it's your first time here, or maybe you've been coming here a long time, but you still don't know Christ as your own personal Lord and Savior. Can I challenge you today? You need Jesus. You need Jesus. And life doesn't really begin until you know Christ. Your heart may be beating, but you're not really living until you come to know Christ. And so Peter here is talking to them about the salvation of your souls. I'm going to pray. We're going to begin reading in verse 10. I want you to follow along closely. The devil hates it that you came to church today. He's going to try to distract you. I want you to do your very best to focus and with God's help. Father, I pray that you would stir my heart. I pray you stir all of our hearts from the word of God today. Lord, help us to be attentive to the scriptures. And Lord, I pray it would be clear. I need your help. I pray you would hide me behind the cross. I pray you would empty me of self. I pray you forgive me of sin. And I pray you'd fill me with the Holy Ghost. And I pray for all those hearing the word of God, that they would be filled with the Holy Ghost and they're listening. Lord, I pray for anyone here not saved that today would be the day of their salvation. And we pray this in Christ's precious and holy and wonderful name. Amen. I begin reading in verse 10. The Bible says, Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. So Peter talks about the salvation of your souls in verse 9. And then in verse 10 he says, Of which salvation? This salvation of your souls. Notice the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. I want you to understand this. In the Old Testament, God gave men of God, the Bible says it this way, holy men of God, spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So God gave to prophets things about the future to be recorded in the Scripture. But it wasn't that God just picked some random men and said, I'm going to give the word of God to them. There were some men in the Old Testament and these Old Testament prophets. And notice what Peter says about them in verse 10. These were men, prophets, have inquired and searched diligently. So they were into the word of God that they had in their moment, in their time. Let me give you a Bible example of that. Keep your marker in 1 Peter. If you know how to find the book of Daniel, go to Daniel chapter 9. Just very, very quickly, we'll just be there for a moment. So we'll come right back and go to Daniel chapter 9. And notice Daniel, one of the prophets, one of the great prophets in the Old Testament, uh, his book is called A Minor Prophet. But in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 2, notice Daniel speaking, saying, In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And, and my point in saying that is Daniel was looking at what he had in the moment in order to understand. So back in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Now, Peter... And you got to stay with me. Some of you here were last Sunday, the foundation, a little bit about who Peter's writing to. Save people that would have been in Asia Minor back about 2,000 years ago. And he's speaking to them, and he's talking about the prophets. And notice what he said in verse 10, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. So in the Old Testament, some people think Jesus isn't there. Oh, he's in every book of the Old Testament. And God used these prophets to record things that prophesied and the way Peter described it of the grace that should come to you. So he's speaking to these modern Christians. When I say modern to us, that would have been ancient Christians 2000 years ago, but he's speaking to them and he said, listen, there was a group of people that they studied the Bible and they studied all they had and they inquired I me and they're praying about it. And God showed them some things about the grace of God that's been now kept for you. Pick up verse 11. We'll continue with this idea. Searching what? This is what they were doing. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. 
I want you to look at verse 11 and try to comprehend it. Searching what? This is what they were doing. They were looking. They were searching what? What it was they were going to be given by God that they should be seeing or what manner of time what was going to happen, when it was going to happen, the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify. So in the Old Testament, the Old Testament prophets did not have the permanent indwelling of the Holy Ghost, but the Spirit of Christ, which is a name for the Holy Spirit, would come on these prophets and would reveal to them what they needed to know about the future. He'd let them understand what they were seeing and the, what they had of the recorded Bible then, and then also gave to them things that would be for the future. And it pertained, notice verse 11, to Christ's suffering... And also, notice how the Bible's described, the glory that should follow. So in the Old Testament, we see things about ultimately the sufferings of Christ. You think of Isaiah for chapter 53. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And here we're thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ when we read the book of Isaiah. You read in the Psalms, and there's so much there about the sufferings that would come. Also, the idea he'd be resurrected. Thou will not leave his soul in hell. And the idea that Christ would raise from the dead. You think about these writings that God gave. Uh, I, I was preaching yesterday in Missouri about Moses and how Moses forsook Egypt. And it says there that he esteemed, in Hebrews 11, the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. The idea was Moses chose Jesus in that Old Testament economy while living in Egypt 1,500 years before Christ had even come to earth with his incarnation at Bethlehem. Now, some of you are tracking this. Some of you are a little bit lost. Stay with me. I'll come back if you feel lost. But watch. Here's the point. Moses was given by God things about Christ that pointed to Christ, including things that were types of Christ. Do you remember Jesus on the road to Emmaus with those two men? After he had resurrected, they thought he was gone. They didn't recognize him at first. He talked about himself to them from the books of Moses, first five books of the Old Testament. So here's the point. There's always been a group of people that studied the Word of God. There's always been a group of people that were hungry to know God. And in that Old Testament, God would show them what they were needing to see, and God put the Spirit of Christ, a name for the Holy Spirit, in them so that they would understand. He also gave them prophecies that were then kept for Peter and the people of that moment. P pick up verse 12. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister to the things which are now reported unto you. So follow this. He said they studied, God gave them things, but they knew it wasn't for them. It was for those living, Peter said us, which means the people that were living 2,000 years ago. So God gave to the prophets what they needed, the people of God in that day. And not only did he give them what they needed, but he gave them more of what they not only they did not need in the moment, but others were going to need, Peter and the people of that day in the early church. And then notice what Peter says here, and don't miss this, in verse 12, which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. So it went from the prophets and to Peter and the apostles in the early church, and he says that's been recorded to then be passed the gospel to the group of people Peter was preaching to. Now here's the thought for you. Not only was it for the prophets, not only was it for Peter and the people of his day, the additional things that the prophets were given, but then it was preached in the gospel, the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should be revealed. It was now preached by Peter and these who had witnessed. They had witnessed, and man, they had their witness, but they had a more short word of prophecy. They had the word of God. They had their own experience, and then they were preaching as personal witnesses about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's the thought. Thank God throughout church history, there's always been a group of people that continue to search out the Word of God and to believe the Word of God and then preach the Word of God. And now we're living in 2024. It's a great day to be a Christian. You say, how do we become Christians? Because God's kept his word for us, and God has always had a group of people that were willing to pass the word and to preach the word. 
And the glorious gospel is amazing. You know, the angels don't need redemption. They don't need salvation. Notice what it said there in verse 12, the last statement, which things the angels desire to look into. Boy, our salvation is an amazing thing. The angels have watched this throughout Bible history and now church history and up to the current moment. And they're, they're looking at that because they don't experience it, including what Kate sang about here. They're a different being. And here we have we, the people who have been by God's grace saved. It's good to be saved. Now we talked again about the trial of your faith. And then Peter says about our faith and the salvation that we have, that God had given it and it had been passed and now we have it now. And it's given to us for reason. And there's things that we should be doing with what we know to be true from the Bible. In the current day, we ought to be the crowd that just like the prophets, just like Daniel that we mentioned, search and inquire. We get into our Bibles, we pray, and watch, church, we want to know how to be living as Christians in 2024. And God wants us to be equipped to do so. Please go to verse 13 and notice the first word, wherefore. Okay? You say, what is wherefore there? It's for us to notice. Because of everything we just looked at, there's going to be the trial of your faith. But thank God you have the salvation of your souls. And there's always been a group of people that God used to continue to perpetuate and pass the truth of the Word of God. And you come up to the day you're living in, we can make application for those of us who are living right now. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. I want you to notice these two words. Be sober. Would you say that together out loud? Ready? Be sober. One more time and concentrate on it. What's the two words? Ready? Be sober. Brother Charlie, what is sober? Sober is the opposite of drunk. It's one way of looking at it. People who are drunk, they are not thinking straight. People who are drunk, they are not alert. Their mind is foggy. People who are drunk, they can't even walk a straight line. Right? They're wobbly. People who are drunk, they can become very, very angry. If you've ever been around a belligerent drunk, you know how they behave. And they can become excessively weepy, and they'll just, you know, there's a tear in my beer. There are people who become ridiculously foolish, including I'm going to jump off this, and they jump off a roof, and they're drunken stupor. They end up getting hurt. There's a lack of control why they're under the influence. And God's word says, those of you who are living as Christian people, you need to be sober. What's that mean? It means your mind is clear. It means that you're under the Spirit's control. It means that you know what you're doing. And it's not because you're so smart, but because of what I just said, under the Spirit's control. And just like the Old Testament prophets had the Spirit of Christ, you remember we just read that name, in them, not permanently indwelt, but he'd come upon them and would reveal to them what they needed to see and know. And in Peter's day, the Lord gave them the permanent indwelling of the Holy Ghost, and God showed them, including Peter here, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, what to record that would be ultimately kept for us living now. And now is our moment, church, where we are to be sober. Now, let me go on record. Sober does not mean miserable. Sometimes people have this idea, well, be sober means I'm supposed to frown all the time. Sober does not mean don't smile, okay? Not at all. That's not what it means. Paul said, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Paul was at midnight with Silas in the jail, and he's singing songs, and he's praying, and having a prayer meeting and a praise meeting with stripes on his back. So being sober does not mean be miserable. You know, Christians should not look like they've been sucking on lemons, right? 
Come on now. We don't have one of these cameras that scan the crowd while you're sitting here in church. But if I did, you'd scare yourself on the screen sometimes. <laughs> when I see from this side, I'm teasing kind of, but reality is Christians ought to be the most joyful people in the world. And it's because you can be sober and know what's going on and be men and women who have understanding of the times that it should bring a joy to your spirit. And he's saying, listen, since you've been given the truth of the word of God and since you've had the gospel preached unto you, and since even with your trial of faith, you understand in the early church, again, similar to our Romans lesson this morning, that there's going to be persecution, there's going to be problems, there's going to be trials, but in spite of all those things, you can still be the right type of a Christian, and I'll make application, living in 2024. Now go back to the verse there where it said be sober, and look at the beginning part of the verse, in verse uh, 13 here, wherefore... And we're going to talk about be sober and what we should do because we want to be sober and how we can live out be sober. Here's what the Bible says, gird up, gird up the loins of your mind. Brother Ty, what does that mean? All right, think about it. Old Testament, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, time of Christ and the um, garment and that would have been worn would have been long and flowing, the ladies especially long. But then the man would have that tunic on. And when it was time, when it was time to go to war, the idea would be in order to have better movement, they would gird up the loins, tie it there and at the belt, and be able to have more freedom as they were going to go to war or, for instance, if they were going to run a race. Right? Paul talked about running a race. Paul talked about warring a warfare. Jesus said, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he sent forth labors. If they were going to go to work and labor, there would be this girding up. And here's the point. If I'm going to run this race, if I'm going to be in warfare, if I'm going to work, I don't want to be tangled up. Bible word, entangled. I don't want to be tangled up. I don't want to trip over excess. Are you thinking? Gird up, what's the verse say, 13? Gird up the loins of your what? Mind. Let me ask you a question. What are you tripping over? The kids will sometimes say, you're tripping. You're tripping. Let me ask you a question. You tripping? What does that mean, Brother Charlie? Are you tripping? Are you falling over thoughts where you just kind of, it's too loose in your thinking? What thoughts are you thinking that contradict the word of God? That you're accepting. The Bible calls it an imagination. It's something the devil has devised as a temptation for you to bring it into your mind and say, that's what I'm going to do. Here's the problem. If it contradicts the Bible, that's loose thinking. That's not good thinking. It's the idea of tighten things up. Tighten things up. Now, let me ask you a question. How's the devil attacking your mind lately? I'll tell you one way he's going to attack. He's going to come at you trying to create a spirit of fear. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, 2 Timothy 1, 7. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. We preached last Sunday night about the trial of your faith, and it's in context here. The idea would be the devil wants to try to get you all afraid and including the idea of suffering. And I'll keep referencing the Romans lesson. Yea, they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Not just based on, well, we have problems because unsaved people have problems. But the problems especially is describing is the idea if you take a stand for Christ, not everybody's going to be cheering you on. If you take a stand for Christ, and especially in Peter's day, the early church, the apostles, they were all martyred for the faith. And there's whatever number of people today spending all the time looking at the news and what's happening in the world and how we're falling apart in America and people are losing their minds over it and they're not being sober. Sober as you see clearly. Sober as your mind is steady. Sober is the opposite of drunk. I've lost control. 
Hey, you're a Christian. Don't lose control of your thoughts. Gird up the loins of your mind and make sure your thoughts line up with the Bible. And make sure your thoughts line up with the Scriptures and the Spirit of God. So if I were to ask you in the past seven days, what thoughts of yours didn't match the Scriptures? Any thought that gives you a license to sin, an excuse to sin, to not follow what God's Word says, that's a lying thought. That, 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 is, that is a lying spirit that's coming at you to try to get you to believe things that don't match the Bible. Church family, please hear me. we got to tighten up our thinking. Right now, some of you are thinking about lunch. Yes, come on now. I won't ask you to raise your hand. But somebody's sitting here thinking, and I hope not. I'm teasing kind of. Brother TJ, you hungry? Yes, sir. I knew he'd say yes, sir. Right? We think about lunch. We're in church, right? Some of you sitting near the front thinking, it's a little warm in here. A little warm in here. Somebody's thinking, I need a nap. I'm in pain right now. I need a nap. Our minds can go all... Y'all look super spiritual. Adjust your halos. Come on now. Your mind, our minds, right? And over the past week, some of you right now so burdened about bills, you can't hardly concentrate on the Bible. Amen. I'm not trying to mock you. I'm talking about that ties in with the trial of your faith. There's going to be things that we go through and there's, there's these manifold temptations and all the different things that could consume us. No, 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 no. We're Christians. Be sober. Gird up the loins of your mind. Tighten things up. You're running a race. You're warring a war. You're laboring for Jesus. You can't afford to get tripped up and entangled with excess loose thinking. Gird up the loins of your mind. That's part of be sober. Notice again verse 13, please. Be sober and here's part of it and hope to the end. Notice it. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end. Brother Ty, what does that mean, hope to the end? It means this, put your confidence in Christ. Would you say that with me? Put your confidence in Christ. Hope here, hope to the end. I hope I win the lottery. No, 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 no. Bible hope is a confidence in Christ. Christ. It's a confident expectation that what God put in his word, God is going to do. And we're here told in verse 13, hope to the end. For what? For the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That means this, all the goodness of God that's going to be coming towards us, both in this world and especially in leaving the next world, we need to be sober and understanding this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasure is laid up beyond the blue. So our heavenly perspective, Romans class people, is that, listen, suffering and sorrow, it's just temporal. We're going to get to go and be with God. Now that hope to real hope. Look in 1 Peter chapter 1 and around verse 3 or so. Pick up 3. Um, ba -bum 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 -bum. Yes. No. Hold on. Yes, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto what type of a hope, church? A lively hope. One more time. What type of a hope? A lively hope. By what? By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You know how you can be clear in your thinking? Christ rose from the dead. If God raised Jesus from the dead and he's promised he's going to raise us ultimately to go and live with God, then we can be sober. We can be clear. We can be at rest. We don't have to be bouncing all over the map. Come on now. Why? Because we have a lively hope. My confidence is in Jesus Christ. My confidence is not in the stock market. My confidence is not in D.C. God have mercy. My confidence is not in the United Nations. I know this will have some of your heads just about explode in the pew right now. My, con my confidence is not in the U.S. Constitution. I I'm just telling you. I man, I'm all for it, man. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm as literal about the Constitution about anybody you'll ever meet. And I thank God for it. And I'm all about let's preserve freedom and do this, that, and the other. But let me just tell you something, all right? There's nothing in the Bible that says it's all about America or any other nation. It is Israel in that context. I, I, I correct myself. But here's the point. Ready? Watch. We're not here just for the preservation of our nation. 
And I have grandkids, and I, and I appreciate freedom. My confidence is not in these things. My confidence is in the Word of God. And my confidence is that God raised Jesus from the dead. And my confidence is that was prophesied in the Old Testament by these men who had the Spirit of Christ. And I'm telling you, He's coming again. That's not a dead hope, it may happen or not. That's a lively hope. How alive is it? Just as alive as Jesus Christ is. May I remind you, come on, church, stay with me now. Listen, he's on the throne. Jesus Christ is alive, and Jesus is coming again. I believe it's in my lifetime. I believe that with all of my heart. I think he's coming soon. I want to live rapture ready. So it's a lively hope. You know what that means? We should be able to be sober. We should be clear in our thinking. We should be alert to the fact that he's coming again. It's super important. Next thought, notice here, be sober means to live as obedient children. Pick up 14. Notice, as, as obedient children. It doesn't just say children, but it gets specific as obedient children. It's interesting. Peter just kind of pulls us in here. Uh, what type of thinking should we have? Obedient children. You said, Brother Tyler, what makes children obedient? They do what their parents say. That's the goal, right? All of you that are raising kids isn't the goal for your kids to listen to you. Obedient children. Well, check this out. If you're saved, you have a heavenly father. Everybody help me. Where do we learn what God wants? Talk to me. Help me. Where do we learn what God wants? The Bible. Right? So, part of being sober in the way we're thinking and ultimately behaving is to just be clear. We know what God says, so we do what God says. You know, the Christian life is not really complex. A, a, a good kid just does what his mom says. A good kid just does, in the sense of good, in the sense of in the term of obedience. They do what their dad says. They do what their mom says. You know what God wants from us? To obey, to be obedient children. Didn't Jesus say in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Not suggestions. If you love me, keep my commandments, right? The proof of your love is obedience to your Lord. As obedient children. You know what would really give us clear thinking? You know what would really help us as part of our being sober? If we just do what he says. Amen. I'm preaching to me now. I'm preaching to you too. We just do what he says. It's part of we're thinking spiritually and clearly. And we're having a Holy Spirit influence upon every area of our life. So as obedient children. And here's the contrast in that same verse. Not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. Kate saying before I knew Jesus. Notice. In verse 14, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. You know what this means? Don't start living like you used to live before you got saved. The former lust in your ignorance before you got saved, you didn't even know all of what God had said in his word. But now that you do, live as an obedient child to the word of God, not going back and acting like you don't know anything anymore. Christians should not be backsliding. Christians should not be, what? The Bible says grow in grace, not shrinking grace. Amen. Come on now. If, if, listen, if you've gone back to the world, the old song said, I, I don't want to go back to the world. There's nothing in the world for me. Yeah. I'm looking straight ahead, not looking behind. Listen, don't go back. Don't go back to pig pen living. Don't, don't go back to the former lust and the way you used to live, the way you used to think. Remember when you got saved, you just believe everything in the Bible. And now because of the trial of your faith or other things going on in the world, it's kind of, mm, well, I know it's true, but I just don't practice. No, 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 practice as obedient children. And that's part of be sober. Notice nextly here, be sober means be holy. Pick up 14 and 15. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you. Church, you see, that's a calling. As he which hath called you is holy, so, three words together out loud, ready? Be ye holy. Notice, in 
all manner of conversation. Conversation is your manner of life. And it says in all manner of conversation. Do you understand as a Christian, you're not supposed to have one area of your life that's unholy. I'm not supposed to have one area of my life that's unholy. Verse 16, because it is written. Remember how we just said you learn what the Father wants from the Word of God? And here, because it is written, be ye, help me church, what? Holy. Why? For I am holy. You know what a sober Christian does? They live holy. They live holy. Absolutely. Why do we live holy? Because he's holy. He's our Father. Closeness breeds likeness. The closer you get to God, the more like God you ought to be. I didn't say we're going to become a God like the Mormons would teach. That's false doctrine. But we ought to be in our behaviors resembling our Father. Christians mean to be what? Christ-like. Everybody help me to be a Christian means to be what? Christ-like. As a Christ follower, my goal is to be Christ-like. And so as a Christian, be sober for me means I want to be holy. That's what God would have for me. I'm clear about it from the scripture. Be holy. Notice chapter 4. Chapter 4. In the context of holiness, for as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh... Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that hath suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of man, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. We liked you better when you partied with us. You're not going back to the old life. You say, why? Because now I live holy. It's part of me being sober. It's part of me being aware it's part of me being the right type Christian. I'm going to be holy. Notice next, number five, to be sober means to pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Now notice verse 17. And if you call on the Father, who without respect to persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Now you might be confused. You say, hold on, you just got done talking about we're not supposed to fear. There's the wrong fear that originates with the devil that has you, instead of being sober, has you being scared. There's the right type fear, which is called the fear of God. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's when we reverence God. That's when we respect God. That's when we understand from God, I want to do what God tells me to do. I want to do what God tells me in the word of God because I don't want chastening. Because the Bible says, whom the Lord loveth, not whom the Lord hateth, but whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. I don't want to be chastened as a Christian. I don't want to be considered by God as a disobedient child. I want to be obedient. How many of you want to be obedient to the Lord? Would you say amen? amen? Right? So notice here in the verse, and if you call on the Father, the idea of with prayer and we address God, we want relationship with God, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work. Here's the simple thought. We have to stand before God someday. And he's not a respecter of persons. That that means he does, oh, okay, you're a clerk, you get a pass. What does that mean? Actually, unto whom much is given, much will be required. And I've got to stand before God. And God knows me. Church, listen, God knows you. And so be sober means we live, we pass the time of our sojourning. You know what that is? The dash between the dates. You've heard that. You've got the date of your birth, ultimately what will be the date of your death. And in between, you have that dash in the middle. You know what that represents? The time of your sojourning. And here Peter said, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. It means for however much time you do get from God to live your life, it ought to be lived with respect to God. A drunk has no respect for anyone around him. He's just all about him. 
You know, as a Christian, we ought to have a proper respect for God. We ought to have a proper respect for what I call today our local church here, the house of God. There ought to be a proper respect for the word of God. Do you all understand how in our nation we have forgotten about God? We li- how many people did you pass on the way to church today in South Jersey? I guarantee not many. But tell you, oh, it's a good crowd today. Let me tell you, every seat ought to be taken. We ought to have chairs all through the lobby. We ought to be blowing up the parking lot with people out to the soccer nets with people that ought to be in church to hear the word of God. But instead, just go to the diner. It's packed. Go to Home Depot. It's packed. Go to the soccer fields all over. Man, it, I hate that our children are not being taught the word of God, but they're being raised playing football, raised playing baseball, raised playing soccer. It's our God in this nation. No fear of God. No respect for the things of God. You know, I'm to be sober. I'm not to let that impact my thinking. I'm not that, uh, to allow that to impact my living. I, I have to face God someday. Because we're sober, we should be sober because the end of all things is at hand. Go to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. You sound doomsday. No, I'm Bible. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 7. Here you go. You've got the letter from God to you right here on your lap. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 7. But, help me church, ready? The end of all things is at hand. What do we do? It's the end. Here's what you do. Notice the next statement. Be therefore sober and watch unto prayer. If Jesus is coming soon, man, we ought to be prayerful. We ought to be watching. We ought to be ready. Why? He's coming again. That's not something to dread. Hey, I'm not dreading someone coming when I know that person loves me. I'm not dreading when I'm going to have a happy reunion. We have this idea somehow like, oh, yeah, but if, I, if Jesus comes and I'm done all my time here, what's here? Cars, houses, lands. Come on now. There's girls laughing right now. And After my wedding day, after my wedding day, after my wedding day. Hey, listen, seeing Jesus is going to be the greatest moment of your life. You don't have to be scared. You need to go to prayer. And we're to talk to God. But it should cause me to be sober. Come on now. What are you letting rattle your cage? What are you getting all stressed about? Oh, I'm getting ulcers lately. I'm, I'm, I'm taking pills. Over. I'm not just trying to mock. I've been there, done that, got the T-shirt. I understand it's easy to get frazzled. It's easy to get fearful. That's not God's plan. Be sober. Be sober based on he's coming again. Let's be prepped. Last thought, we should be sober because the devil is our adversary. Look in chapter 5. Chapter 5 and verse 8. Be sober. It's right there, right? Be sober. Why? Be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Hey, if I'm going to wrestle the lion, I want to be girding up the loins of my mind. I I want to make sure I'm in a place where I'm filled with the Holy Ghost, new levels, new devils. Can I go on record? Hey, and that's not original with me. That's Pastor Doug Fisher that taught me that principle. But if you're going to be in a Bible-believing church in 2024, number one, the devil's not happy you're here, honestly. And number two, you're in a minority as compared to what the majority, and we're no better, we're just blessed. I don't deserve to be sitting on a church pew, but it's the grace of God that I do. But here's the thought, man, if I'm going to be in a Bible-believing church and our goal is still to get the great commission, the gospel out to a lost world, the devil's going to fight against you. At your tri- well, I want to have a Christian family, brother. I'll tell you what. You talk about sober. I want to be sober for my family, and I want us to be an obedient family to the Word of God, and we want to be ready when Jesus comes. If you're going to try and have a solid Christian family in 2024, you may as well just spray paint yourself blaze orange with the devil's attacks. He's going to come at you. But listen, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We don't have to live in fear. The righteous are bold as a lion, and Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Are you with me? The devil may come and growl and do what he does, but man, we can be sober. 
We can just be clear. We don't have to be rattled. We can just be obedient. We can be under the Spirit's control. We can know what the Bible says. We have a hope. It's a confidence in Christ. It's a lively hope. He rose from the dead. And we're to be watching and we're to be ready for when the Lord comes. So be sober and gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and hope to the end. Be sober and and live as obedient children. Be sober and be ye holy. Be sober and pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Be sober because the end of all things is at hand. Be sober because the devil is our adversary, our enemy, our opponent. And we do need to be careful with that, that we don't walk into the battle not prepared. Luke 12 is the last verse we'll look at. You know, Jesus talked about this idea of girding up your loins. And the idea would be this, I'm prepared. I'm prepared. And in Luke chapter 12 and verse 35, the last verse we'll look at. In context, this chapter is talking about not getting caught up with material things. Verse 24, uh, verse 23, the life is more than meat and the body is more than raiment. 24, consider the ravens, your height, 25. Which of you with taking thought can add to a stitch, stature one cubit? I stopped at five, seven and a half, that's it. I can, I can stretch myself out on a bed or whatever I want with machines. I'm not going to grow. Why am I trying to? If he then be not able to do that thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow, and all these different things. And seek not, 29, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. Doubtful mind is opposite of the clarity that comes from being sober, right? Seek the kingdom of God, 31. 32, fear not, little flock. God will take care of you. 34, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Last verse, ready? Verse 35. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. You know why? Because the bridegroom's coming. And you're to have your light, your lamp, you're to be ready because he can come at any time. And you're to be prepped for that and let your loins be girded about is watch, be ready for action. Hey, as a Christian living in 2024, I'm ready for action. But I'll tell you what action? How about we practice why we're still here for, which is to tell lost people about Jesus. The choir song said, weep for the souls that are lost. And man, I read that on the screen. That just struck me. Weep for the souls. The lost soul. Weep for the lost souls. I know you have to provide for your house. The Bible says if you don't, you're worse than an infidel. I understand that in 2024, kids want to go out and play and should, and you moms are there to guide the house, and I get it. And I'm not against you being able to get out on the golf course or something. And I have my family, and we do the different things that we enjoy. But can I remind you, Jesus is coming, and there is a hell, and it is my job and it is your job to get the gospel out to the lost world, and that is why we are still here and I really do think that that sober thinking is sober thinking to where we have a heart for souls. Are you purposely stirring yourself up about people who need Christ? I was on the airplane, got on Chicago to fly back last night. Empty seat next to me, hallelujah for empty seats on airplanes. Young lady up against the window, reading a book, writing out longhand, kind of like a journal looking thing. I caught it out of the corner of my eye there. Getting off the plane, I went to give her a gospel track. And, I, and she didn't take it right away, and she didn't know what it was. It about scared her to death. That's kind of like I was walking as I'm handed to her. And ultimately, she did take it. And as I was giving it to her, I said, have you ever read the Bible? She said, no, I've never read the Bible. Looked like a bright kid. Probably a university student somewhere here in Philadelphia. Happen to be from a different country. But she said this, I've never read the Bible. Let me ask you a question. Where would you be today if you had never read the Bible? Right. 
Where would you be? What would you believe? Oh, these people, I can't believe what they believe. You don't know what you believe if you haven't been shown the Bible. Right. Amen. Last night, Rocco picked me up from the airport. 10 o'clock, we're driving, we're talking about some things in his life. I said, I want to take you into Philly, show you an area I'm burdened for, a people that need the Lord. Man, we went there, and he, I don't know if he'd ever been to that section before, and we're driving through there. End up on South Street, 10.30 at night on a Saturday night. Any of you that know anything about Philly knows what that looks like. You know, that's the crowd that's out there, the young set, and, you know, it was warm enough. The doors are open to some of the clubs, and it's flowing over into the street. Went down Broad Street. Kimball Center was letting out with whatever performance they had. You know, that's some more dignified people. They just party in a different way. Same booze at both places, by the way. Yeah. Amen. And I'm not anti-orchestra. I go when I can, but my thought would be this. It's just the same old devil's lies of what it is that supposedly makes you happy. You know where those people are this morning? A bunch of them slept late, or they're going to get brunch, or they're going to do. How many gospel tracts do we take as we leave today and actually hand out? How many people do we actually speak to about Christ in the course of our week? How is it in Solid Rock Baptist Church that we're running some of the lowest numbers ever for our organized soul winning times? When we're closer to the coming of Christ than we've ever been, Pray tell me how it could be that we have so few people that will put that on their schedule. I didn't say you don't witness the rest of the week. I'm talking about an organized soul in a time where including as a church family, we go out like an army to take the gospel to a lost world. Do we weep for the lost? Is that song sung? Choir member, do you live what you sing? Do I live what I sing? To my shame, there's too many people. Too many opportunities I've let pass by. And I say all that because when I think be sober, I can't think of anything more sobering that I may be the only person standing between a person and them ending up in hell. Sometimes I look at a lady with her kids and I'll think, I remember when my mom was up and saved. And I'll think, that lady, I'll hesitate, you know, because in the flesh, you know, do I want to give them a gospel track? And I'll think, what if that were my mom? What if it was me as kids? I was witnessing to the Catholic priest in D.C. Try to, try to get him to watch the video I'd done of the gospel. I look at that Catholic priest. If my mom hadn't gotten saved, I could very easily have become a Catholic priest. Very easily. 20th anniversary of the church, we kind of did this what, this is your life as if you hadn't gotten saved from my parents. My brother acted like he was my dad and that, and my sister acted like it was my mom and that. In the middle of it, I come walking in in a Catholic priest outfit. You know, I know it's kind of like, and it wasn't really meant to be humorous. It was more to appreciate the grace of God and what God's done for the Clark family. And I don't know how we can look in the mirror or read Peter where he's talking about, man, the Old Testament guys, they're in the book and look what they passed and now the gospel and the suffering is this life. How can we have all we have and yet be so unaware? You ever been around a drunk? They have a hard time staying awake. Oftentimes, they'll reach a point where they, they just, doesn't matter what's going on around them. And they'll be loud about it. You know what they're in? They're in a drunken stupor. They're asleep. I wonder when God looks down. If he sees me and says, wake up, boy. Get your mind clear. Gird up your loins. Go to battle. Get the gospel out. I didn't die for you just to enjoy your Christianity. I died for you to spread the Christianity. Father, I pray, dear God, help me. Revive my heart, Lord. Oh, God, give us a burden, Lord. May you help our church to weep for the loss. Let's stand. Be sober. It's not what we have to do. It's not a miserable experience. It's opportunity. It's privilege. Be holy. 
be obedient children. Keep your hope. Keep your hope. Pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Be ready to meet God. Fear God in the right sense. Get your thinking straight. No, he's coming again. The end of all things is at hand. Be alert for the devil. Man, we need dads that are awake. Grandpops that are awake for the attacks the devil's trying to bring against our families. If you're here and you don't know Christ, oh my, I'd crawl to you right now to beg you to come to Jesus for salvation. Rebecca's to my right, Mrs. Hawkins to my left, Damon's in front of me here. If you need salvation, I know it would take some courage, but if you'd come to where they are, they'll take a Bible privately and off to the side. And in just a few moments, show you from the Bible how you could be saved from hell and be given the gift of eternal life that Jesus paid for in love and wants you to have today. If you have children in the nurseries or in a junior church, we'll watch over them. We'll bring them to you. But if you need to be saved, why don't you come right now? Is there anybody who'd say, you know, I don't know I'm going to heaven and I'm concerned about my soul. I need prayer. I won't make you do anything you don't want to do, but I'll pray for you. If you're here and you don't know you're saved and you like prayer, would you raise your hand real high? Anywhere in the house this morning, I need prayer. I don't know I'm saved. I don't know I'm going to heaven. I need prayer. Pray for me. Just raise your hand real high and I'll pray. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. I'm going to have a prayer here and I'll pray. If you want to be saved, I know it takes courage, but if you'd come, you could come to Christ right now and get it settled. You don't have to live with doubts. Father, I pray for people in this room that have raised their hands, said they're not sure they're going to heaven. Lord, it took some courage for them to do that, and it shows that you are speaking to their heart. Oh, God, I pray you give them courage to come to Christ. I pray you put that desire in their heart. I pray they'd want Jesus more than anything and be willing to receive him. And I'm praying this in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray you'd accomplish it. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, pianos continuing to play. There's still time. If you raise your hand or if you didn't, but you need to be saved, would you come right now? Would you come to Christ right now? Would you come to Christ right now? Would you just step out by faith and just come and get it settled? God will help you. You'll never regret it, I promise that. Just listen to the Lord. Listen to the Lord. Be sober. Sober is what we get to be. Aware, alert, clear. I'm preaching to me today, let me tell you. I want to live rapture ready. Father, I pray you bless each person who's come here to the altar or prayed at their seat in response to the word of God. And Lord, I pray that you would help our church family. Lord, we start at the service with revive us again. Oh God, revive us again. I pray you'd hear me. Lord, may it begin in my heart. God, help me to weep for the lost. Help me to care about things that are most important. Lord, bless our dear church family. Bless the marriages here. Bless those raising kids, influencing grandkids. Bless people that are single here but have a heart for you and they're going on and just loving you, Lord. Help our church to be a holy place as a church family. God, we need your help. We call out to you. We ask for your blessing, your anointing. And we pray in Christ's precious and holy and wonderful name. Amen. And you may be seated. We're going to baptize. If you're struggling with addictions or stubborn habits, we have a Bible-based program called RU, Reformers Unanimous. And that's a very important program. 
And if you are struggling with addictions or stubborn habits, Brother Joel Patterson is right there at the back. You can meet him at the Welcome Center right after the service. They meet on Friday night. Are you baptizing? Go for it. I, I have no problem. Yes, go ahead. Let's, we'll have the uh, crew come and that's joining the church. This is Rocco and Amelia and Navia. And uh, Navia Orsini and Rocco and Amelia Malucci. We've got Marcucci's and Malucci's in this church, all right? So uh, come on over here. But all these folks have accepted Christ as their Savior. They've been baptized, believe it's God's will for them to be part of the Solid Rock Baptist Church family. So with an amen and a hand clap, would you welcome into our church family? And uh, come on by here in a moment. Right when Brother Charlie's done the announcements, come on by and shake their hand. All right. I'm going to let them sit right here on the front row for just a moment while we baptize. Y'all come Either way, yeah, come on, sit right over here if you don't mind. We kind of did things backwards. That's my fault. But uh, we'll just sit there for just a moment, and we'll watch the baptism. I would mentioned if you're struggling with addictions or stubborn habits, please see Brother Joel at the Welcome Center right after the service. If you're new to our church and interested in becoming a member, go to SolidRockInfo.org and register for starting point classes. Brother Chad Buley will contact you. Brother Chad, raise your hand. That's Brother Chad Buley. He'll be at the Welcome Center after the service. You could talk to him there. You could register online. I want to thank everybody who helped with the Master Club Regionals for our children yesterday. Let's give a hand to everybody who helped out and also to our children. We'll talk about that tonight. Appreciate them. This is the last day to sign up for ladies volleyball. They begin in May. So this is the last day. If you're a lady and would like to play, go to solidrockinfo.org and please register as soon as possible today. Friday, our Christian school, Thursday and Friday, we have our flag football tournament that will be out back here. And we need help with concessions. So from 3 to 6.45 on Thursday and from 12 to 7 on Friday, we could use some help. So my note here says, come join the party. All right. If you like to feed bad food to good kids, that's what we do with concessions. Deep fry away. And uh, it's, I know we're contributing to child. Well, never mind. I'll just keep moving. Contact Brother Judd with any questions. I don't know that we can sign up online. I don't see that. And the last thing here on this is save the date, the Solid Rock Baptist Church Secret Sister Reveal. I don't even know what all else I should be saying about that. But Sunday, May 19th, Sunday, May 19th, after the evening service. Baptism, before we baptize, baptism shows on the outside that a person is not ashamed of what Jesus did for them on the inside. So when you see somebody in the surface of the water and them out of it, it's a picture of the death of Jesus. They go under, it's a picture of the burial of Jesus. They come up, it's a picture of the resurrection of Jesus. Water does not wash away sins. It doesn't happen, okay? Somebody believes and then they're baptized and it's just publicly saying, I want to identify with Christ. I say this often, but my wedding ring doesn't make me married. It shows I'm not ashamed of my wife. If I don't have it on, I'm still married. The point would be with baptism, you can be saved and not get baptized, but you can't be saved, not be baptized, and still be obedient. So as obedient children, this is a step, first step in growing as a Christian. And so we're going to baptize at this time. Church, this is Adriana, and she attends Rowan University. We have a ministry that goes on campus there, and they have a Bible study. And through that ministry, she accepted Christ as her Savior on April the 4th. And so we thank God for that. I said, how'd you get here? And she said, Kate and Damon. I said, oh, Kate. She said, I love Kate. And uh, what a blessing it is to have someone Share the gospel with you, and uh, it's a forever change in your life. Adriana, have you accepted Christ as your Savior? All right, if you'd put your hands on your nose. It is my privilege to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, buried in His likeness and risen to walk in newness of life. Amen. Now, I don't know what gets you excited, all right? But I know what gets God excited. And I just got done talking about a young lady that didn't know the gospel, hadn't read the Bible. But here's a young lady, because of our young people reaching out at Rowan, she got saved and got baptized today. I could just go and run a lap about from here to Atlantic City on that one because of being excited. And here's the thought. There's so many more out there that need Christ that we need to go out with a burden. When you leave, these signs always say you are now entering the mission field. Grab your gospel tracks. Tell somebody about Christ this week. Bring somebody with you to church, right? 
Let's stand. Thanks for being in church today. Our new members are coming here to the front. Take a few minutes, come by, shake hands. So thrilled. And that's awesome. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Let's close in prayer and then make sure you take just a moment, come by and shake some hands. Father, thanks for loving us. Thanks for letting us be in church.